This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Today, we're going to cover the book Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer, a book, an epic novel, actually, that covers multiple wars and uh, uh, follows the, the story of a man named Sam Damon. General Stanley McChrystal is the four-star general who recommended this book in Tools of Titans. He uh, was replaced by Petraeus after a Rolling Stone article where his aides were quite dismissive of high leadership. That didn't go over well, and he forfeited his position as a result. There are two podcasts that uh, Tim Ferriss did with General Stanley McChrystal, and I highly recommend listening to those. I listened to those as I read this book, Once an Eagle, and it was really really good. Uh, He gave... Uh, Stanley McChrystal gave one analogy talking about chess, uh, where he said chess actually is not a good strategy game for army leadership because too many things are fixed in the game. And yes, there's a lot of strategy involved in, in thinking about it, but he says for for army leadership, the 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 positions are not fixed, the um, the pieces are not fixed, they're they're always changing. And so I thought that was interesting because you always hear about ch- chess being a great strategy game for. For being able to think through problems, but he said, uh, for for army leadership, it's not uh, not the best game. No, it'd be uh, football would be closer to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Uh, you know, I've I've long said that football is kind of like chess. Only uh, the the players aren't uh, the players have their own uh, will and volition and uh, can you know do things other than what the coaches tell them to do at any point. And so you have to add those dynamics and all sorts of other things, but. War is even more, more like more, uh, more uh, in that direction, which this book does a great job of summarizing. Yeah, and it is uh, definitely not a rah rah book, <laughs> as um, McChrystal points out. He says he gives this book as a gift most often. Uh, the, the book he gives most often as a gift because it covers both the good and the bad of life in the military, and that uh, that is quite evident right from the get go. So. I was uh, I was actually surprised. The back of this book says that this is required reading for West Point and Marine Corps cadets, and this book is not kind to West Point <laughs> at, at not, any point. At, not at all. Oh so I, I was I was I was quite amazed that uh, that it is required re- reading at uh, at that fine institution. So about the author Anton Meyer. He was at Harvard as World War II broke out, and after Pearl Harbor, he enlisted and served for three years in the Pacific Theater. So this this book, Once an Eagle, covers Sam Damon, the uh, the fictional character Sam Damon, as he starts out as a as a soldier in World War One, and uh, and then goes through a number of different things. Multiple uh, wars. Yeah, multiple wars, but war and peacetime, and you get to see see him in, in all sorts of, sorts of different situations, even working in industry for a while, um, but then getting into World War II and and then uh, being of the age to be an advisor uh, for Vietnam. Well, not not technically Vietnam. Not technically Vietnam. <laughs> so that's one, uh, one interesting thing I wanted to talk about before we dig in to the book a little bit, but just how, how it is written. It's, it's a novel, uh, it's fiction, but it is, it, you come across actual real people who were, who were high up in the army, in the U S army. And, uh, and you're, you're also talking about actual wars, but then, um, it's all fictional characters with, within that. And, and the reason I mentioned that is, is another book that comes up, uh, one that I just finished a, a few weeks ago about face is, very similar to this book, but About Face is nonfiction, and it's a, the, the actual story of Colonel David Hackworth. And Hackworth actually references Once an Eagle at, at, as having a, a major influence on him, uh, especially when the book came out. So, yeah, so uh, when they talk about Vietnam in this book, Once an Eagle, it's not, uh, they don't say the word Vietnam. Uh, they don't 
they don't say the the actual battle locations, but it's it's uh, it's different names that they use that that you could could quite quite easily f- figure out what uh, what it's referring to. Yeah, it doesn't take very long before you realize, like, oh, Asian country where we're dealing with communism and <laughs> you know a number of these issues. But he he's you know changed the names uh, pretty significantly throughout and. Uh, uh, you know the the names of the regions and even the names of uh, of the country that uh, that they're fighting in winds up not being uh, Vietnam. So uh, I'm trying to remember what is the name of it that uh, that he goes with uh, Cotillon, right? Uh, so it's uh, uh, Cotillon, and the, and they're fighting against these uh, Cotillonese uh, there, which is a, uh, a, a pretty significant different uh, difference from Vietnam. But it doesn't take very long to figure out what's going on again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, would you like to start with with a little bit of overview and yeah? And I... Well, first of all, th- this this it really isn't just one book. It's it's uh, it's actually a five part epic uh, that has uh, completely different theaters of action, whether in wartime or peacetime, for each one, and you get to see different characters, uh, different secondary characters, some of whom become primary characters of their in their own right in each one. And, you know, more gets pulled in in each successive phase, uh, building up all the way to that uh, conflict in Cotillon uh, that uh, that that ultimately concludes the book. But uh, so so number one, uh, this is this is a really long uh, read. But man, is it a a rewarding read and a really uh, enjoyable isn't always the right word for it because there's so much of it that is uh, that is painful or you know it deals with some of the difficult so many of the difficult aspects of of, of human nature and of uh, of the way the world works and all that that it's not always enjoyable but it's or not always not always pleasurable, but it's a, but it's always an enjoyable read. Uh, it's, it's very elegant. And, you know, I, I really, really like this book and, uh, it's one that I've, I've, I, not only will I recommend to people in the future, but it's one that I have recommended, uh, to already to some friends, uh, particularly if you're interested in military, in the military or in, uh, in, in anything in that, in that area, this is going to be a book that's going to be right up your alley. And, you know, I, I, my grandfather's on each side served and, you know, this is something that's always been uh, closer and, and closer in my family anyway. Uh, so, you know, this is the sort of thing that uh, would definitely have been up my alley, but it's, it's right up there now. I mean, this is, this is really, really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, it takes you through the full gamut of emotions with, you know, from elation to, uh, you know, making you want to cry on multiple occasions. It's just, it's outstanding. Yeah. Just to give it, uh, the listeners a taste, I want to uh, read a, a paragraph. Uh, and the, the first word of the paragraph is war. War was not a war of flame adventure filled with noble deeds and tilts with destiny, as he had believed, but a vast, uncaring universe of butchery and attrition in which the imaginative, the sensitive were crippled and corrupted. The vulgar and tough fibered were augmented. And the lucky were lucky and survived, and they alone. And was that all? Was there no truth behind this? Didn't the just cause triumph? The good deed resound to heaven? That's just one paragraph. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, there's another one that, uh, that that actually is in the same. It's it's I think on the next page, uh, where he says he concludes this, and he says. If there was a destiny that shaped our ends, it was a very capricious one. The Allies had invoked God's aid. So had the Central Powers. Each side felt its cause was just and true and had committed crimes innumerable for the greater, the all-important end. It was all part of the sacrifices required for victory. Yeah. And then he says... But for his own opposite number, the German major, limping arduously through the bitter wintry streets of Kassel or Leipzig, all those sacrifices had been in vain, a mockery. 
And so if a fair and lasting peace were not affected by the big four, would be his own sacrifices as well. And that, man, I mean, we, we've already talked some about this uh, phenomenon in a previous episode. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if this is the first episode you've listened to, we've also talked about uh, some of this in the episode on the things they carried on war and, you know, how things, uh, how things work in war and how war is, is not a great thing. How, you know, all these epics about how great war is, that those are lying. And there's a lot of that in this book, that Myra is, is unflinching in the way that he talks about war is as not a heroic thing, as, a, as butchery, as awful, awful stuff. And yet at the same time, as paradoxically this necessity for, for just people to actually be involved in, otherwise the unjust will take over and, and make not only war, but even peacetime uh, a, a terrible thing for, for everyone else. So that's, the, that's the, the terrible paradox that runs through this book is that people and that there are lots of really nasty people out there and people in general are untrustworthy, which is why you need good people to actually be involved in, in things like the military in order for the military not to just run amok and, and cause all sorts of injustice beyond what is just naturally going to happen by trying to prevent injustice. So it, it, it's, it's really, really getting at some deep philosophical questions and tough philosophical issues that grapple with the problems of, of war and all this awful awfulness that we have to deal with in a world that is not ideal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and we, and we follow Sam Damon through the, the story and he, he is, he, he's a guy you want to emulate, em, emulate, He's for the he's most a, part. You find yeah, out that he the, does have flaws. He does have some, yeah, and and those were actually quite shocking when you get to them because you think this guy can do no wrong. Uh, but what's great, and, and Jason, you highlighted the the five different sections of the book, and even though they're different sections, the same characters weave themselves throughout it. So you've got Sam Damon as as this is this soldier 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 uh, a, a leader of men a reader of men un, uh, uh, someone who understands men and can then lead them very intuitive in, experiential yeah. guy yep uh, and then you've got his counterpart counterpart uh, Mass, Massengale Courtney Massengale and you see them their lives intertwined throughout throughout the different parts of their lives and um and so that that was really that was really interesting as well. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you uh, that this I, I've had I actually have this book at the at the top of my my list currently in ranking the the books that we've read so far, and it stayed there even after having read uh, quite a few other ones. So um, I, I I call it my standard bearer for war books. It, it, this is kind of the book that all other books about war will have to be judged by in the future for me. Yeah. It's all, Uh, I mean, it's almost to the point for me of, of being just justifiably called something like an American Iliad um, mm -hmm. because of how rich the character, the, 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 uh, the character development and the uh, accurate way of, of getting at, some of the, the, the problems and the greatnesses, the greatness, the great aspects of, uh, American, American culture in general, and then military culture overall. And, and just the, the roundness of the whole story is really, really magnificent. And, and it's not that there's no, that there are no problems in this, but you know, the Iliad has its own, but it, it's, it's, it's like that. It, it, it is that kind of epic. And it's, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, again, I, I'm right with you there. Yeah. And it, it is, uh, it, it is an epic. I mean, it's, uh, uh close to 1300 pages. <laughs> I so, don't, uh, I, I almost never know how many apart. pages, I almost don't, never know, know how many pages things actually are because I'm always reading them in eBooks yeah, or, right. or via audiobook or whatever. So yeah. And by the way, I cannot recommend the audible version, the audiobook version of this book highly enough. It is incredible. So if you like books that way, definitely get this one. To close out the over, overview of the of the book here, there was one section in particular, one uh it was two chapters that dealt with one particular battle called the Battle of Palamangao. 
And for this, the, uh, the, these two chapters set the book apart for me. And, and this is where I nearly cried. Uh, I, I would tremor at reading some of the, did you? Oh, yeah. Devastating. I mean, it was just, it was heart wrenching and, and descriptive and just, I did cry. It, it was incredible. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and so I, I was thoroughly enjoying the book, but when I came to that chapter, I was like, okay, this, this puts this book on a, on a different level here. So, well, let's do when you get into some of our, uh, favorite, okay. What, what, one other, one other, one other tie-in you wanted to talk about also, if I remember right, was you wanted also to mention uh, some differences in terms of uh, where this book goes versus natural yeah, born heroes. Yeah, and which is um, one that if, we, if we did uh, one of the first books, if you we did, if we uh, think back this, to the to you know, natural born uh, we'll heroes and and what made the Greeks tick, uh, do you remember what that was? Like. Well, for, for, for like fighting the Nazis and, uh, what, what was it that, that made them want to, to fight? You're talking about where he does the, uh, he talked about the, the Metis of the Greeks where, you know, you have this unique Greek culture where, uh, he, they, uh, they embrace this, uh, uh, almost thieving kind of, uh, mentality. Is that what you're talking mm-hmm. about? Yeah. 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 And, and then, then that allowed them to, uh, to keep the Nazis at bay. That boldness. Yeah. And, and so you kind of think like, well, so the Greeks are this unique people in history to have, to have been able to do that. Uh, but we have a whole chapter here on, on the, the Chinese and, uh, Sam Damon joins the, the Chinese, the, the cool Mintang. I probably butchered that, but that's, uh, <laughs> in history, it's Chiang Kai-shek's army battling, uh, Mao's communists. So he, he's embedded with them to fight, to fight the communists and, and also to study their methods and to study kind of the, the different kind of warfare, a, a guerrilla warfare. And what he notices from them is not that they've got this unique, uh, cultural, cultural ability to, to do these amazing feats during wartime, but that they had hope. Which is what I had flagged in <laughs> natural born heroes. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you did, no, you it was did. hope. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, th- I thought that was a cool, I mean, it, it really, it, it, it's kind of like a blatant thing in natural born heroes and, it, and it's just a small part of this book, but I thought it was a cool, a cool uh, connection point. And then you, you get a lot of tie-ins with, um, the things they carried, uh, once an Eagle talks a lot about what, what they carried and, and not just physical items, but, uh, emotional and mental items that these soldiers carried with them. Yeah, if you have to choose between the two books, as much as I liked the things they carried, though, uh, this one, although that one's a lot shorter, this one is, this one gets to a lot of that stuff uh, and a lot more. Yeah, and that that was kind of my main point of this this book. I, I almost feel like the, this book alone covered a lot of the lessons we've gotten <laughs> out of the other books of Titans. All books. of them. Yeah. 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 All right, so, so let's go ahead and get to the favorite quotes. I'm going to start uh, with uh, with one or two of mine because, uh, yeah. as usual, I've got an extra one or two on here. Uh, looking at uh, the the shared document we have here, you've got uh, at least one of the same that I have, so I'll not read that one. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and um, let's see. One, uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes here, a man has to do what he can think well of himself for doing, or he's nothing. Hmm. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Another experience was valuable only if one imbued it with meaning, drew from it purposeful conclusions. The fact of the matter was that he had never thought he had acted swiftly, intuitively. Now he must school himself to think, think soberly and well. What conclusions then was he to draw? And that's one of the things we keep coming across in this book is learning the difference between, well, you know, this person's experienced and, you know, has experience and therefore should be elevated by the experience or, no, this person's actually learned from experience. And there's a big difference between the two and learning to think 
and to see consequences and all that is is a big big theme in this book. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to go with one of mine that uh, that kind of takes your heart out a little bit. Um, he's he's walking around a battlefield and he's describing the smell. Oh. And so I'll, I'll uh, cut in right there. If you could bottle it, the smell. If you could bottle it, store it in some tanks just outside Washington or New York City or Chicago. And then when the drums begin to beat, when the eminent statesmen rose in all their righteous color and the news rags and radio networks start, started their impassioned chant, if you could release a few dozen carboys on the Senate floor, the executive offices of DuPont, Boeing, Ford, Firestone, the trading posts on Wall Street, and seal off the exits. Repeat every three hours as needed. Rx. By God, that would take some of the fun out of it. If you could only bottle it and feed it to the fire-eating sons of bees, <laughs> jam it down their throats. And I mean, that's that's amazing, you know. Yeah. When when the when the drums begin to beat for for war, when 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 a society becomes anxious to 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 seek revenge or grip get back what if you could bottle the worst parts of war and release that and 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 share it and 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 show what it's really like i mean that 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 paragraph right there was was something else (laughs) yeah okay so um here's another what a mistake life is. You're never ready for each thing that happens to you. And then I thought, no, that's the marvel of it. If you were ready, there'd be nothing to it at all. It would be like frogs in a pool, eating and propagating and swimming around endlessly. Nothing more than that. Pain makes you think, doesn't it? And this idea that actually at times, it's, it's pain that actually causes us to realize that there's something... Uh, fresh or it's that that sharp sharpness of life that makes life valuable to us and and to some to some degree it's precisely pain that reminds us of this i I found that to be very compelling Uh, i'll go with one other one here anybody can accuse anybody of anything there's no action on earth from adam on down that can't be misconstrued if the beholder has the inclination and oh my goodness, is that not true? Yep. <laughs> yep. What's funny is, I mean, it's, it just took a while to go through all the the things I underlined in, <laughs> in even just preparing for this uh, this podcast. But I had a lot of these same ones ones underlined. There's some really good stuff in this book. Why don't you hit one more? Because uh, your numbers are your quote number <laughs> number of quotes are. Okay, I'll go with another short one. This is uh, talking about life in the military. Anything could be swung if you had the right talent for playing Drop the Soap. (laughs) Oh, gosh. And about uh, how the hierarchy and all that works. If you could just had the right talent for playing Drop the Soap, you could get whatever you wanted. Well, there you go. (laughs) Here's one that comes from the uh, the very end of the book. Uh, Sam Damon giving some advice to, uh, to a former soldier friend of his, his uh, son. Joey, if it comes to a choice between g- being a good soldier and a good human being, try to be a good human being. Oh, that's one actually I was going to leave until later, but it's good that you brought that up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap, actually, uh, when we get to the conclusions and such, I'm gonna, that's one of the things I want to talk about in this. Okay. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, where where th- that particular theme throughout this book is really, really... Uh, that that thread runs throughout the book, and it's subtle, and then it just gets increasingly the uh, audible. You know, the volume of that lesson gets greater and greater the longer the book goes, which is really really interesting how he manages to to do that. Mm-hmm. All right, um, let's see. Huh. There, one of the one of the things I wanted to get into here is the. Uh, uh, the emphasis of the book on chance and on uh, on taking advantage of chance and how all this stuff works in terms of controlling what you can control and understanding that so much of life is chance. 
and how he deals with that. And, and a couple of the quotes deal with that, and these are a little bit longer, so I'm going to go ahead and read a couple of them together. One of them, he says, this is uh, Damon, your whole life was chance. This is him thinking. They could say anything they liked. They could tell you it was hard work or brute strength or being sharper than the next man or getting to know the right people. But all that was small potatoes. What ruled a man's life was lucky accident and the power to read signs clearly, as his grandmother had told him. Some were false, some true, and it required the greatest wisdom to read them purely. So that that's a really interesting statement that, you know, it... Yeah, it's fine. You know, getting to know the right people, working harder, all that. Yeah, none of that stuff, none of that stuff equals the just random chance aspect of life, which mm-hmm. you can't control. And that's going to have a lot more about governing your destiny than anything else. And, you know, the older I get, the more I think that's true. Well, I think soldiers probably know that better than than anyone. I, 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 I it makes me think of that scene. I think it's in. um finding uh saving private ryan where a, a guy gets shot in the head but it's a helmet and it, it bounces off the helmet and he takes his helmet off to look at it like oh man i'm the luckiest man in the world and then he gets shot in the head again <laughs> this time he doesn't have his helmet on yeah. but that but that idea of chance and in in a soldier who makes it has fought next to a guy that didn't make it right and the only the only difference is that by chance you happen to be standing here instead of there yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, of course, the question gets asked, but what then? And this is much later in the book. What then? Why should anybody care about anything if it's all just stupid chance? And then the, the answer is, the best thing to do is accept it. Accept what you are and go on from there. You can't change the circumstances of your birth and condition. It's unprofitable to torture yourself with too much speculation as to why you've been placed in existence at a given point in time. That's the whole challenge of life, to act with honor and hope and generosity, no matter what you've drawn. You can't help when or what you were born. You may not be able to help how you die, but you can and you should try to pass the days between as a good man. And that, that's what, that, that really is what this book tries to get through over and over again. First of all, is what, it, what does it look like to be a good human being in the midst of a world that's going to push and pull you to be anything but? All the incentives are to benefit those who are going to be selfish. And what does it mean to live with integrity and not be selfish and not be less than a good man. What does it mean to be a good man? And this book over and over and over again keeps putting its various uh, characters into those situations where they have to make the decision and they're put there by no choice of their own. It's just simply, in some cases, by no choice of their own. And some of them, some of their choices do lead to other things that are just by chance. But ultimately, chance comes and then they have the decision of, okay, well, the incentives go this way, but what would, what would, it, what would be the right thing? And some choose one thing, some choose another. And you get to see some of those consequences, and it's fascinating throughout the book how he how he gets uh, gets that done. Well, it's cool too that uh, one of our upcoming books, and, and one you know quite well, is <laughs> all about that very question: the the Republic by by Plato. So yeah, Dicaeopolis. Yep. So let's see. Do, do yeah, you have ahead, any more? Go, yeah, I'll, I'll have one or two more after you finish. Okay, this one. I'll do mine. Inflexibility. It was the worst human failing. You could learn to check impetuosity. You could overcome fear through confidence and laziness through discipline. But rigidity of mind allowed for no antidote. Yeah, that, I had that one also in my favorite quotes. That's actually at the top of my list. Uh, but since you had it, uh, we'll go with it. And, yeah, and, and you, so you, 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 it. you contain one other sentence after that where it says it, can, it carried the seeds of its own destruction. Yeah, that, and that's the worst thing about inflexibility, right, is that it carries mm-hmm. the seeds of its own destruction. If you're not flexible, if you're not willing to learn, the arrogance of inflexibility is automatically going to lead to destruction. Yeah. And, and it's, that's, as you've got in your, in your notes here, that's one of the uh, many great lessons quotes in the book. There are lots of, yeah. you know, fatherly wisdom type quotes throughout this book. Yeah. So a couple others for me. Um, 
She felt that men put too much emphasis on their genitals, worried too much about this particular kind of wound. Was it the worst of all? The very worst? Was it more insupportable than the loss of both legs or both arms or eyesight or the terrible head wounds that left the victim only da a dazed, uh, paralyzed facsimile of a man? Yet they all continued to fear it most, clapped their helmets over their crotches or pulled pad covers or barracks bags over them during shelling or bombing raids. If they were hit in the groin or thighs, it was the first question they asked the medics or the surgeon in boundless fear. And there's just some, that's part of the tongue in cheek stuff that you see, you know, at, at different points in the book. There's a, there's a lot of, of uh, humor about how people think about things uh, throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's, there's this one that uh, it's another one of those uh, lessons. This one's not specifically the, uh, the lessons, uh, lessons quotes fr uh, from the narrator, but here's a, a quote from, and actually I'm going to go two more, a quote from one of the, uh, uh, the the guerrilla fighters or guerrilla fighters that he's learning from, and he's you know well why you were, you were high born and you know you were you were high class why are you fighting with these people and he says listen, I discovered and then he says, if a system could produce me, an arrogant selfish debauched young murderer and brigand as an ideal something to aspire to, that system was wrong, a world of greed corruption favoritism crushing taxes, the most blatant and ruinous disregard for the rights of man. And that's, that's an interesting thing. Like, we have to think, if a system can produce me, if the system can produce this kind of person and this is the ideal of the system, then something's gone wrong. And, and uh, he, he brings out sort of, he brings that out as a, as a critique of, of Ameri where America's going on a number of things. Uh, and then finally... Uh, this is, again, another one of those lessons things, but it's done it's sort of in a third-person way where they're talking about another character. And he says, that's what he had, though. The, the special, the thing that made this person that they're talking about special. He was always aware of consequences. He never forgot about them, and he never deceived himself about them. That, that's very rare. And I've mm. found that's extremely rare. People do not like to think about consequences. And then even those who are willing to think about consequences often don't think about them deeply enough. That unintended consequences are everywhere. And we have to be very careful about everything we do. And the, the higher up we get, the more authority or the more power we get, the more we have to be concerned about, not about the direct consequences of every action, but what are the downstream unintended consequences that we wouldn't have necessarily anticipated unless we really think about the mechanisms here that we're putting into play? And there's one character in particular that this is the, the thing that they say positively about this character. And, you know, that that is something to aspire to is to be someone who's always aware of consequences and not and, and, and never forget, uh, never forgot about them and always deceive and, and, and he never deceived himself about them, always honest about their about what consequences were uh that's another really really uh interesting aspect of of that particular character uh who is one of the one of the obviously uh better characters of this book and you know on the side of integrity mm -hmm. so that said let's go ahead and shift gears uh now we're gonna we're gonna transition from here into uh a, a zone where we're gonna definitely discuss a number of spoilers. So if you are planning to read this book, if you have not read this book yet, then I highly, 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 highly recommend that you skip forward to one hour, 10 minutes and 50 seconds into the podcast where we're going to go ahead and start to wrap it up rather than listening from here to there, skip forward to the end read this book, and then come back at some later date and listen to our discussion of the, of the spoiler zone. But I don't want to ruin this book for anybody, so if you listen from here until that point, well, your, the spoilers are on your own head. So let's go ahead and get into it, Eric. Yeah, and, and going a little deeper into that, it, it's one of those books that where there are so many surprises in it that... 
d- yeah, don't 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 spoil it because uh, you you want to be surprised by this how the stories come out and and how the what happens to the people and and that sort of thing and, and we will be discussing that so yeah and, um, and 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 so that that's your second warning here's your third <laughs> warning I'm telling you this book even if you're somebody you're like oh, I really don't don't really care much about spoilers I'm just going to continue to listen on to this pod no li- listen we've both read this book don't listen. From here, if you don't pl- if if you plan to read this book at some point in the future, don't listen from here because it will spoil things that it's going to make the book much less enjoyable for you to read. So here's your third warning: please skip forward to the end, seventy minutes and fifty seconds into the podcast, rather than listening from here, and we'll come back and revisit this at some point later on after you've actually finished the book, which again, we both highly recommend. Yeah. One of the, one of the biggest things that stood out to me is, uh, something we've seen in some of the other books. And then just for me personally, that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot in my life this year and and learning a lot about, um, in, in just talking with friends and, and, and seeing him, seeing it in books, but the, the practice of daily habits and the day by day, day decisions that, one makes during their life and how that impacts the person going forward. And we see that, you know, being, being able to take a look at the same character over 1300 pages really gives you a chance to, to see someone uh, from their childhood through uh, multiple wars and and then different capacities in, in those wars. And there's, there's a, a a big scene in, in Damon's life at the, uh, at, at the beginning in, in his childhood where he confronts a bully. Uh, it's at a hotel bar and he actually kicks the bully down the stairs and gets rid of the, gets rid of the problem. And in here, he's just kind of this, this meager little kid and, and he, and he, and he does this, but that story follows throughout the book in, in that it's almost if Sam hadn't, if, if Sam Damon hadn't have done that at the beginning of his life, Perhaps the other parts of his life wouldn't have happened in 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 the ability to lead men and to lead well and in, in to become the man that that he was. It was it was a huge turning point, but it was it it had to happen. I mean, he he had to confront that bully when he was weak, when he was a kid, to be able to do the things later on in life. So later on, uh, and, and of course here we're, we're assuming that you've read this, but later on when we're we're into, introduced to the to the soldier Joe Brand, who ends up dying for Damon, it's the same thing. Uh, Joe Brand, when people were talking bad about Sam and talking about Sam's Sam Damon's affair, it was actually true what they were saying, but Joe. Well, I mean, let's go back a little bit further. I mean, that Joe is the guy that he went to he that that was basically uh getting uh getting uh poor treatment from others in the military because of his Native American background. And Damon actually went to bat for him and actually took a case, you know, defended him uh in, you know, in a court martial and, you know, put his career on the line for this guy which others were disgusted by his, his willingness to do. And it was the wrong thing for him career-wise. It hurt his career. And mm-hmm. then later on, Brand happens to be the guy that, that throws himself on a grenade. And he happens to be the guy that, that like you were about to say, when, when, uh, when uh, Sam actually does have an affair, Brand is the guy. And now you go ahead and finish your thought. Well, Brand, Brand's the guy that comes to his defense. and Over and over and over again. And, and what that told me, because jumping on a grenade is not is not something you have time to, to think about. Jumping on a grenade is one of those things that you, you either do it or you don't. Yeah, and, 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 and you're trained to do it, and it's a reflex. Yeah. But he, by I, I think that by coming to, to Sam's defense, obviously, you know, being, being saved by him in, in the earlier scenes uh, by Damon, but then... But uh, Joe coming to his defense on on these multiple occasions, it it was it was a natural thing for him. It, it was some. It, it wasn't just oh wow, Joe Brand all, all of a sudden became a hero and jumped on a grenade. It was like no, he he was he was 
trying to save Sam through the whole thing, and the the grenade was was just another piece of it. Sam taking so, care of him meant that he was going to take care of Sam from below for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. And, and I just thought there there were some really cool. Uh, character character development, I guess, in, in in that sense, but but also seeing it from the other side on on people making the wrong decisions and, and what that leads to. Yeah, even the good characters well. in some cases making making decisions that are surprising. I mean, those of you who've read the book, I mean, when Sam has an affair, has, does have an affair late in the book, you know, I, I I'm I'm right with you, Eric. I, you know, I I totally did not see that coming in, in terms mm-hmm. of how Sam every decision that Sam had made to that point. But Myra really does it artfully where, you know, at that point, you know, Sam and, and, and Tommy are at, at such a, um, uh, a loggerheads. I mean, she has gotten so bitter with him because of the, uh, b- because of what's happened with their son and all sorts of things to where, you know, it's well, precisely, China. yeah. And, and China, yeah, China was the thing that, that really, yeah, so and, you know, you, you get all of those, you know, you get the you get the difficulties at home that are that 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 uh, that have driven a wedge between him and his wife, and it's precise. It's so believable. It's precisely how this stuff happens, even for a good man, and you start to see that you know even even this good man who's almost an ideal man is is flawed. Mm-hmm. That that he is stretched to, to, to the limit and then eventually, you know, winds up sleeping with this, uh, with this nurse and carrying on a fairly extended affair for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that, that shocked me while reading was later on when they're in the, the Asian theater, uh, which would, would be Vietnam. Oh, and you also had, you also, I think if I remember right, you were wanting to say something about, uh, Tommy's affair as well. Well, yeah. And, and, uh, Tom, yeah, I mean, Tom, Tommy uh, Damon's wife has has an affair as well, but then also just kind of flirts around with stuff too, to where she's even getting Through close to book, yeah. to Massingale, like the 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 worst guy. Yeah, well, and Massingale, um, you you get to see inside his head at different points, and you realize that this dude is really really messed up. Yeah, <laughs> like when he's fantasizing about her. It's not like sexy time. It's like he's like imagining her in essentially a, a pretty close to a, a, a rape scene, but not true, not not a rape scene so much as like sadism and like smearing like awful all over her. And, and it's like, oh, my gosh, like what is wrong with you, dude? Well, and, and it's about power. Yeah, know? it's, it's about all power about power for him. for him. Everything is about power for him. And that's yeah. why he's such a dangerous figure. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, the, back the, to the uh, Asian theater. Yeah, so the the other thing that really struck me about Sam and, and where he's the he's the flawed individual is is he's he's more of an in an, an advisor role when when it comes to Vietnam, but he sees Cotillon. torture going on. What what's that? You mean you mean Cotillon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's more, um, but he sees some torture going on with the group that he's he's a part of, and he doesn't stop it, and and it just it seemed out of character. And I, I didn't know why he didn't try to stop it because it, it seems like he could have, he would have had the, the moral authority or the, the um the prestige at that point to at least say the rank. something, yeah, yeah, to to say, hey guys, come on, um, but he doesn't, and and so the the affair and then, kind of letting the torture, slide, uh, seemed out of character, but. And, and to I, don't, degree, I don't know if the book would have been as good, though, without if, if he was what you said, like the ideal man throughout the whole thing. Right. No, it wouldn't be. And, and, and again, part of the part of this is that by the end of the book, we find out that, you know, Damon himself is starting to realize like that he's starting to see his own flaws. Right. Mm-hmm. At the beginning, so much of this book is told through Damon's eyes and you go from his youthful idealism to recognizing that he himself is not what he, what he thought he was. And the reader is slowly read into that. He is not what he thought he was. He also is human. And, and so you see, um, uh, this, uh, I mean, he, 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 tr- it, actually his idealism is what helps him be a, such a person of integrity. But even there he finds out, you know, that there's this great quote, he had been wrong about the world. 
He had gone forth believing he was indestructible in the fury, the the lordliness of his ambition. And he was not indestructible. He was like all the others, vulnerable flesh, old mortality. And you, you discover that, you know, everybody at the end of the day is still a man, is still human, is still a human being. And that involves certain frailties. And then, you know, toward the end of the book, at the near the end, you know, you get that, that great quote, which, which he is realizing toward the, you know, near the end, he's realizing maybe that was simply the price you paid for the truth. You exposed your own frailties along with those of others. So he spent all this time trying to expose the frailties of others and to try to, to bring some integrity to the system. But in so doing, the truth also exposes our frailties. If we become bearers of the truth, we become those who expose our own frailties. The truth gets us too. Nobody, men, nobody makes it out alive. Nobody makes it out, uh, in, in you know, having having done it all exactly the way that, the way that it should be done. And he has to learn that lesson. And and we as readers end up learning that lesson. And we learn where his willingness actually to try to be the hero, to, to, to go and do stuff that's beyond him, ultimately leads him to do things that he's not proud of, leads him to give in where he shouldn't have, and leads him to, uh, to not say something in, in, the, in, in the midst of torture, or to, you know, to, to have an affair, or to do different things that it's because he stretched himself beyond endurance that he wound up going against his own ideals. And so you see the contradiction there uh, in him. And, and again, like you said, without that, the book is not nearly as good, even though, mm-hmm. it, I, even though as a reader, you wish it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's the, like you finish the book and you're like, man, I wish it had gone differently. But then you realize like that's what makes this book so brilliant. Well, and, and then the, the, the Joe Brand character we were talking about earlier, I mean, that, that's kind of the sentiment you have while you're reading it. You're, you 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 identify with Joe Brand because he's sitting here. No, guys, there's no way he did this. That, that's not his character. That's not who he is. Um, yeah, and so it's neat that, that he brings in that character. By that point, you are no longer as naive as he is, right? Yeah, and, yep, and yep. he is you, like one one yeah, section a few ago, chapters right? ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's and that's it's, it's brilliant. just brilliantly done. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got other things, but I I I um I mean, there's like one other main point I want to hit. And are, are there other, were there other things that you wanted to get into? Yeah, there are a few, there are a few. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm building on one point that you, you actually had in your, your side here. You had said that you really liked that Sam made his mark in industry. So say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I've got a few things to add to what you had in, in the notes. Okay. And this, this comes in, in one of the peacetime sections. Uh, obviously he's, he's back in the United States and visiting family and, and some of the family ask him to come in and it, and it's, it's kind of, like you get the sense that the these guys in business are are so arrogant that that in in a way it's like well let's see if this army guy could could help us yeah you know they're um, rich and so they obviously think they know better than anybody who yeah make they, money. they've yeah they've made it because of the because of that um but he Damon takes his his leadership of men and his reading of men and he takes that into industry. And he takes that same refusal to back down to bullies and he takes that into industry and he makes a huge mark in this, in this warehouse, uh, and, and turns the whole thing around. Yeah, he fixes and, He fixes the logistics problems that the company had been having that, that kept the company from, from being much more profitable. Yeah. And, and it was simple things, but it, 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 it was things that are very hard. I mean, it didn't there's not a lot of people that want to stand up to a bully. Uh, there's not a lot of people who are, are willing to have the hard conversations and the, and the difficult conversations that, that he had. And there's not a lot of people that are willing to be disliked to, to do what's right. Yeah. And to step and right had into all that. those things <laughs> and do that. Right. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I, I loved that chapter. I mean, I, I loved that, um, it wasn't that. Oh, okay. I've got discipline because I was in the army, so I, I can then take that into the uh, into industry and, and and try to make a mark. It it had more to do with his his moral makeup, his his character, 
And but, but also the but also the set of skills that went with that in terms mm-hmm. of being able to read human human beings and being able to figure out uh, you know, what is the, the real root problem? How can I get to the root? How can I cut to the root of this issue? And, and that, uh, that aspect of it also that the skills are there. And, and that actually, one of the other things that I found interesting about that chapter is how I think that chapter does a good job of, uh, of explaining to the potentially skeptical reader who is not going into the military. Well, why should I be reading this book? Well, because, the, the lessons that apply in the military apply everywhere else too. And, you know, that's something that, again, the things they carry talks about that the things they carried talks about when it talks about um, how war really just amplifies humanity. And, and so much of what this is, what this book shows is that, you know, he amplifies, it amplifies, uh, uh, he's seen things, amplified to such a degree that then when he gets to see it in peacetime, it's a whole lot easier to deal with. It's like, well, geez, I dealt with it when we were under, you know, when we were actually under literal gunfire and I had to deal with it there. This is a whole lot smaller. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But that, that to some degree is one of those chapters that also serves that function of saying, yeah, well, this is also, you know, all these lessons about how Sam is dealing with this problem and this problem or how this person handles this all those lessons still apply across the board, even if you're not in the military. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, for those who, who have read this book, uh, you know, you, you, you'll, you see this, that, you know, the, the lessons about management that you see and, and, and executive leadership and, and, and proper ways of leading and coaching and, and, and managing people are, are there throughout. Sam gets it. And, you know, you see in this quote, for example, about one of the uh, one of the groups that he takes over that was a problematic group initially. And after he takes them over, they, they stop having the same problems. And it says he demanded a full hard day, but he was generous with passes. The company got the word quickly enough. And when they found he was willing to listen to their troubles after retreat and would go to bat for them, they began to respond. And it's one of those things like, dude, just love, love your empl- love the people you're managing demand as much out of them as, as you, as, as you can, but actually listen to them and show them that you're there for their best interests. And they'll, they'll, they will run into bullets for you. They'll jump Mm -hmm. on grenades for you because they actually know that you will do the same for them. And if you're not, if you don't come across, if you don't really get, get it, get it through that you are that, that you're, that you would be willing to jump on that grenade for them then they won't do it for you. They won't care about you. They're not going to listen. They're not going to change that. And he brings that into the industry uh, industry context where he's like, no, I'm going to, we're going to do this the right way. And th- even if that makes it harder on me, we're going to do it the right way. When that makes you- it harder on me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take the easy way and neither is anybody else. And he sets that example and eventually they get it fixed. And he talks about rank, you know, he, he, rank is obvious, obviously there in, in a company as well as in the army. Um, and, and he has this quote, he hadn't had the rank. And so this was, I believe referring to Damon, he hadn't had the rank, but he had this other thing. And that was what they all wanted, what they all leaned on. So the, uh, the, the buddies or the family members that, that hired him for this were the, the muckety mucks, the, the big guys, but they, they couldn't fix this problem. They, they weren't willing to, to do that. And, and it was more of a top down approach if they were going to try to fix this problem. Yeah, because if they were um, going to fix it, they're going to have to get in the trenches. Mm-hmm. Uh, in you know, metaphoric, metaphorically, they're going to have to get in the trenches and actually do it themselves. And they weren't going to do that. That's what they hired people for. <laughs> yeah, and and it and it really gets to this this uh, idea, which is the the last thing that I, I wanted to to highlight of the individual and how how Damon cared about the individual and his his nemesis or or opposite in the in the the novel his antagonist yeah. antagonist yeah uh massingale this brilliant quote uh and this comes from page 1119 of the <laughs> the uh, paperback version his sin there was none greater was that he had decided neither grace nor nobility nor love existed in this world and then a, a little later in the quote hateful and demeaning of that fellow at the sink and that refers to uh, earlier in the book where I, 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 I can't remember the exact story, but it's basically he, he saw a guy at the sink and didn't care about him. 
Uh, and, and so it gets to this idea of the individual. Massengale did not care about the individual. There's this, this uh, section that talks about him planning for a battle, and he sees people as dots in preparing for this battle. They're not individuals to him, but to Damon, each person with him is an, is an individual. Massengale, it was not. Yeah, and, and that that yeah. flows throughout the book, but it, it it was just it was so powerful to see. Yeah, you you can you can talk about that idea on the on the grand scale, but like to to see it Act go it through out. someone's life that that mentality, and then how it just continues to degrade Massengale into in and then into who he becomes to where he he gets mad at the atom bomb because it more effectively <laughs> does what he wants to do in wiping a bunch of people out so that he gets glory. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly to, you know, uh, it's pretty clear to me that Myra did not have a whole lot of love lost for general Douglas MacArthur, <laughs> uh, because Massingale in a lot of ways serves as kind of a cipher, as far as I can tell for MacArthur, uh, hmm. where one of the things that, that, that uh, Myra wants to get across in the figure of Massingale and also how he handles how, how Damon and, uh, and also uh, uh, Caldwell, how they, they, they end up not moving up and all this stuff. One of the things that, uh, that, that really get, that comes across here is this paradox of power that Myra seems to want to get across. And that is uh, that the wrong people wind up, getting power and it's precisely because they're the people who are willing to do whatever it takes to get power so you know uh you, you know caldwell uh, early on when he gets promoted to general says yes i suppose so i'll become a crabbed un unapproachable old fool eating like an epicurean and wrangling with the french brass every afternoon the prerequisites of power and <laughs> wow yeah or later on, when he tells Damon, they don't respect us. They being the, the higher ups, the, the people truly in power, the, the, you know, the four star brass and above, you know, the people, the joint chiefs, those, those people, uh, they don't respect us because we don't properly value ourselves. And that is because we refuse to accept the bloody world as it is. He walked up to Damon and stood in front of him in an attitude of affectionate menace. Don't freeze on things, Sam, like those muffin heads over at Bonbon. Promise me you won't let your mind atrophy. Self-righteousness, it's the occupational disease of the soldier, and it's the worst sin in all the world. Yes, because it spawns arrogance, selfishness, indifference. You know, all of that stuff is, 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 is again, is, is critiquing who comes into power. Later on, we get, uh, we get Massingale that tells Sam... You're an anomaly, Samuel. You're a wild anachronism. You've completely failed to identify yourself with the interests of your class. Right? Damon's not interested in defending his position and his power and in aligning himself and identifying himself with the interests of his class. He's interested in, in what's going to benefit his men. And that's precisely why he doesn't move up. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And later on, you get this other quote where it says, the only trouble, and this is as you move up in, in, in the military, the only trouble was the higher you got, the less you were able to get up front. You were drawn inexorably away from what was essential until finally, like MacArthur, you sat in a lofty, immaculate tower 3,000 miles from the war and gave yourself up to dreams and schemes, the symbols without the realities that bore them, until at last, perhaps, you even mistook the symbol for flesh and blood. And that is, it's, devast it's a devastating critique. And, and again, it gets to this question of, you know, and, and, and you, know, you get to things like the Hitchhiker's Guide for the Galaxy, the person you want in power is the person who doesn't want to be in power. Unfortunately, the people who that wind gladiator. up in power... Are precise, yeah, exactly. The people mm -hmm. who are in who wind up in power are precisely the opposite. They're the people who've found the way to drop the soap, who found the way to move up and make sure that they've made you know glad handed the right people and they've looked after their own th th their selves long enough to cover over their weaknesses and to, and not to go to bat for the wrong guy 
at different points so that they don't wind up, you know, down where Damon is. They wind up moving up the chains where Massingale or moving up the uh, the ranks where Massingale goes. And so the, the 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 you see this paradox of power throughout the book that the people at the top who are making the decisions are precisely the opposite of the people that you actually want making the decisions because of the nature of what it takes to get there. What's the what's the stick called again? Oh yeah, the the the, uh, the swagger stick that Damon swagger loves stick. so much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And even, the, you know, symbol of power and, and throughout, you know, you get things like the swagger stick or the good old boy system to where you've got the one the one uh, 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 officer who tries to basically rape another uh, one of Damon's friends wives. And they have to basically let it, you know, they, they, they get him off. They, they get him away from her. And then they, they, they don't press any charges or do anything because it, it it's going to submarine them, not him. Because yeah. the, the power is going to look after itself. And, you know, these days, especially, that's a hot button topic. But it has been going, that sort of thing has been going on forever to where, you know, the, 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 the man of power can do whatever he wants because anybody who accuses him is going to be the one that's going to get damaged. And so yeah. he can get away with sexual assault. He can get away with all sorts of improprieties, all sorts of awful things because who's going to challenge him? <sighs> anyway. <sighs> I think mean, I mean, this just shows the, the 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 number of different topics and in situations in the book. I mean, it it, it just covers so much. Yeah. It's just so rich. Oh yeah, I, I I love one I love one other quote from Caldwell. Uh, we can't be bothered with the sordid details, the actualities of human motivation. We stubbornly, sublimely refuse to see man as he is. Sam, we're so damned certain about how he ought to be. We know how he ought to be. He ought to be American. <laughs> and, you know, again, it, the, the, book, the book is written from such a firmly American and patriotic point of view. And then at the same point, just r- really Blasting. just blasts and critiques so much about American arrogance yeah. and what makes us arrogant that we, we think that everybody should be like us. And that's why we need to go to world, go, go to war to make things more like us. And it's like, wait, but we're committing atrocities to do this. Like that's yeah. not how that works. Well, and, and props to the, to West Point and the Marine Corps for, for, for not hiding this book or, or although pushing it aside, but, but embracing it. You although know? there've been some who've criticized uh, West Point and the war college and others for, for making this required reading because they've said that, you know, the, the, Emphasis on the, the the distinctions between Massingale and Damon have actually led to a weakening of the of the military, in that it's it's emphasized the experienced uh, you know soldier coming up from below kind of thing to the point where uh, the those who are who are excellent at strategy and and at uh, uh, at you know the, the Massingales uh, of the world. Uh, those who are uh, more natural, natural in that a- avenue, haven't uh, aren't developed the way that they should be. I don't actually really agree with that perspective, but we should we'll we'll, uh, we'll link to the to one critique uh, in the in the show notes on that on that end. Uh, I actually don't agree with 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 where that goes because I don't think that's actually the the parallel. I think that misses the point of the parallel between Damon and, and Massingale. It's not that one guy came up from below and the other from above. It's it uses that. It's that one guy actually loves his soldiers and, and recognizes that things are more than just symbols and the other's out, out for his own power. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that that distinction, that difference needs to be emphasized more than any than, than where they came from or whatever. And, you know, it's just easier to, to make that point at that point uh, in, from Myra's perspective to show that by showing Damon's career versus Massingale's and, and the way that they, they go. But has more to do with their attitudes toward power than it does their, you know, where their, where their experiences or their skill sets lie. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, they're at the risk of continuing to monologue, just a couple other subjects that this gets into that are worth, uh, that are just so, so good. Um, there's, you know, the, the, the pessimistic view of humanity and war, in general. So not just war, but hum- humanity and why war happens. There's just some brilliant uh, exchanges here that get to some very 
uncomfortable truths about how human beings have worked uh, and also about how wars come about. I mean, you've got this, this whole you've got this whole theme that, that surfaces on several occasions about the connection between economics and trade and war, right? The company that Sam helps save winds up selling a bunch of stuff to the Japanese, right? And then the Japanese end up, <laughs> end up using that stuff to bomb and, and fight against the U S yeah, and of and course sol- soldiers find metal in them that is made in the USA right from shrapnel and why and why you know at the end is uh, is the US really going to to uh quote unquote Vietnam uh or uh, why why are they going to Vietnam well because they have trade interests over in Asia that they have to protect and you know this uh, Caldwell again has that that soliloquy to Sam when Sam is saying at the end of the at, at the end of uh, the uh, of uh, 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 World War II, he's saying, you know, Sam, do you honestly believe people are going to stop being greedy? And or, actually, this is the end of World War One, isn't it? Uh, do you honestly believe people are going to stop being greedy and resentful and full of pride and prejudice? Do you think they will quit hating and fearing? Do you think that the lordly heads of government are going to abandon their methods of seizing and holding power, of gaining advantages over their neighbors? Why should they change? Who should, ca- who should cause them to abhor the only rules of the game they know? And even if they were to do so, do you believe for one minute their own citizens would let them get away for it? Or get them, get a, get a, let them get away with it? So he says, you know, this is, this is where things go. And then, of course, Massingale, on the other side, has a fantasy, and like the way he's thinking about things, he says, well, you know, post-war America, he's thinking about the next war, would bear no more similarity to pre-war America than the Restoration monarchy bore to, uh, uh, bore to revolutionary France. What would emerge would be a vast impersonal juggernaut of industrial cartels, a mountainous Im- administrative bureaucracy, and a prestigious military junta. And beneath these, far beneath an emotional and highly subservient citizenry whose attitudes and actions would be created, aroused, manipulated, subverted by the roar of the mass media. It was so clear. Why couldn't the dunderheads see it? Whoever could see it, whoever rode this wave deftly, keeping just ahead of its boiling crest, would hold the future securely in his fine right hand. And danged if that doesn't sound like modern America. Well, in 1968... This is when the book was written. Holy shnikey. I mean, that... that 1968. So he, he nailed it. I mean, that, that, that is about as prophetic a paragraph of present-day America as you could imagine. Yeah. That a juggernaut of industrial cartels, a mountainous administrative bureaucracy, and prestigious military junta, and beneath these, far beneath, an emotional and highly subservient citizenry whose attitudes and actions would be created, aroused, manipulated, and subverted by the roar of the mass media. Yeah. Drop the mic, Anton Myrer. You have <laughs> nailed it. It's fifty years ago. Yeah. And you know, again, what we find is we have met the enemy, and it is us. Yep. <laughs> right. Yep. So, and I found this book to have a very Tolkien-esque view of the world. I couldn't help but think of J.R.R. Tolkien throughout this book. Because Tolkien has this 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 great uh, comment in one of his letters, where he explains his his view of the world and what you know sort of what underlies uh, the Lord of the Rings, and he says, "Actually, I am a Christian, and indeed a Roman Catholic, so that I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat, though it contains and in legend may contain more clearly and movingly some samples or glimpses of final victory." Hmm. And this idea of history as a long defeat. That is, it's in Lord of the Rings, and it's one of the things that makes Lord of the Rings so compelling. That they're that they're that that you know ultimately they can, they can't resist. They can't, but they can do just enough to hold it off in their own age. And mm-hmm. and you know what it being be doing the right thing at that moment that that preserves everything that it is that that that, that is that is good and right in the world. And throughout this, you get the sense that. No matter, no matter how much the Sam Damons of the world may do, they're not going to hold back the forces of the Massingales. They're not going to hold back the people who get the power. But you know what? At the same point, they're still, you're still walking that road of long defeat that 
it's still worth it. And it's still worth bringing integrity to it. And it's still worth fighting for what's right. Even if sometimes that means you, you become a little bit of what you hate. You, you do your best not to become what you hate. It, or, it's just, it's um, a, an amazing book. Well, and, and for the end of it, for, for, for Damon to live through all of what he went through <laughs> and then to die while seeking peace. Yeah. What a devastating end. Yeah. Oh, mercy. And, and again, that, that brings about that Tolkien-esque view of the world. Yeah. That's, you know, history is a long march to defeat. But in the very defeat, can, the, the very defeat contains the seeds of that final victory. And the only way to, to victory is, to, is to, to go through that defeat and to, to recognize that, that, that long defeat. So yeah. Well, you want to get to con- conclusions, or do you have anything else? I mean, I've I've monologued plenty long enough now. No, I'm ready to to wrap it up. Um, I wanted to, to to in the conclusion here discuss the the title of the book, Once an Eagle, and it comes from this quote. So in the Libyan fable, it is told that once an eagle, stricken with a dart, said, when he saw the fashion of the shaft, with our own feathers, not by others' hands. Are we now smitten? Oh. And I'll let you pronounce. Yeah, that's by the Greek author Aeschylus. Okay. I mean, it, that that hits on exactly what we just talked about with the um, we've met the enemy and, and the enemy is us. Yeah, we are the author of our own destruction. Demise. Yeah. We, the, 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 the source of all the problems in the world is us. And that and is you, a devastating you see it, lesson throughout this book. And you see it on the mass level in the, in the book, but you, you see it in the individual level as well. And not just from the bad guys in the book. You see it in Sam as well, you know, making, making wrong decisions that, that lead to, to consequences. Um, his family, you know, it, 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 you see the consequences in his family. Yeah, yeah. What he fights for is family and country, and and particularly family. He wants nothing more than his family to 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 do well, and to he loves his family more than anything else. And what does he lose? His family. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I I mean I don't. It's my number one book so far. Out of uh, I'm I'm on book thirty five, and it's my favorite one so far. So. It, it, and, and looking through the notes in preparation for this this podcast, because I, I read this book in um, April or May, yeah, May. I, think um, I read it in May or June. Yeah, we 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 read this one close around the same time. Um, it was close to your your graduation. Yeah, I think actually I finished it right around then. So yeah, it would have been May. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but but even looking through the notes again, it, it's it's like okay, well, he just nailed right there what it took book. 30 or, you know, book 25 of books of Titans, a whole book to, to, to figure out. Okay. He just, he just hit on, uh, one of the main things we, we learned about natural born heroes. Okay. Here, here, he, he, he nailed, uh, the things they carried. Um, yeah. you know, obviously those, those books are, are great too. The other ones that we've read, but this one, it, it's, it's almost like, uh, you could take a lot of the, the lessons that we pulled from, from books of Titans and, and they're all within this book. And, yeah, I, I, I can't say enough about, about the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it's, it's a very enjoyable read, but then as, as you stated before, it's, it's a devastating read as well. And it's, it's one that it's going to shake you and it's going to, uh, make, probably make you cry, uh, really challenge you on your, your thoughts on, on, on just a ton of different, different topics and, and big ideas, small ideas, uh, small decisions, big decisions. So very good book, you know, 1300 pages, but it's, uh, it's worth it. And it, and it's, I, I'll, I put I'll be it up reading there it with, again, even though it's 1300 pages. I mean, that's, the, yeah. that's the reality of it. I mean, I, I read Les Mis and, and Les Mis, uh, Mis Robles was one of those books that, uh, that it, it's an epic. It's, it's, it's one that, you, that you'll never forget. Um, but I, I almost put this book on, on a similar, if not same level in the impact and just the level of of character development of of highs and lows and of of reality you know it, it's it's not a raw raw war book 
uh, it's not uh, war is glory. War is, is courageous men doing acts of valor. No, and nor, it's, and it's, nor is it just war is hell. Yeah, yeah. And this book nails the balance of that. And I, I think it's one of the most realistic books I've written. And it's going to be you've fascinating <laughs> for us. What's that? You mean the books you've read, you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said that I've written. Um, it's going to be fascinating when we discuss the book about face because it, it is so similar, but uh, some some neat differences as well. And, and the, the main one being that uh, this one's fiction and the, and the other one about face is nonfiction. Um, so we get to see some uh, unique things that uh, that one can do with fiction that uh, that Hackworth is is not able to do in, in nonfiction. So looking forward to that discussion as well. But but yes, if read this book, that, that's uh, that's where I'm going to close out. Yeah, you, you absolutely need to read this book. The, the, the last word for me on this is the ultimately the the message the i think the and, and again this is a similar book to dune in that you can th- there's so many threads that that run through this book that you can read this book from you know 10 different angles and get different really important lessons that run as threads through the whole book uh but one thread that i found really powerful in this book is the importance of family and integrity, that family and integrity are what really matter in this world. Uh, and, and, and loving one another as individuals is what really matters in this world. Uh, and there's this one quote toward the end of the book that, that really sort of sews this, this theme up. And I, I want to leave, uh, leave the podcast with th- this episode with that particular uh, quote. So I'll go ahead and, and close with that. There's always time. It's the will that's lacking. If there isn't time for the personal touch, as you call it, we might as well give up and go home. Wow. All right. Well, in that, uh, in that light, that's going to go ahead and do it for us today. There's not a whole lot more to say. Uh, we could talk for hours and hours on this book, but, uh, and we may eventually come back and talk more about this book in the future. We both like it enough that we may do a second episode on this at some point. But uh, before we get out of here, just a reminder, you can follow along with us at booksoftitans.com. You can also message us at any point uh, on Twitter or Instagram at Books of Titans. And if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast. You can find all of our past episodes through iTunes, the Android Marketplace, or your podcast manager of choice iTunes now of course Apple Podcasts and if you're enjoying this podcast if you enjoyed this episode please be free or please give us uh, five star ratings help a lot uh, uh, in terms of uh, getting us more visibility uh, on these platforms give us uh, good reviews and uh, share with your share with with, with friends uh, share your fav- favorite episodes on social media we'll be back soon to discuss the next book which will be Chengis Khan and the making of the modern world. On behalf of Eric Rostad, I'm Jason Staples. This has been the Books of Titans podcast. Keep listening, keep reading, and keep